you in the space too. We get okay. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome everyone coming in on Zoom. Uh, welcome to Concordia University's Four Space, and thank you for joining us for the last panel of this series uh, titled "Abundant Intelligences: Indigenous Knowledges and AI." And this panel is uh, moderated by the co-director of the Indigenous Futures Research Center, Professor Jason Edward Lewis. Jason, welcome back. There's my mic. Uh, so I'm just saying welcome to everybody. 
Uh, and uh, so this panel is uh, on uh, abundant intelligences, indigenous knowledges, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and this is a this is a project that we just sort of started kicking off the ground over the last uh, over the last year. But it's based on sort of work and thinking by various people going back a number of years. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, the first of them, Jada, uh, who's going to um, uh, give some more context on the whole project. All right? All right. OK, let's go. So um, uh, Dr. Jada Yalgomaz, uh, who is in the, in the top right of the screen over there, um, is a postdoc at the Indigenous Futures Research Center working in the Abundant Intelligences Research Program. Her PhD work brought together social theory and interactive technologies, such as large machine learning models or social robots, to consider how our conceptions of the social are changing. Her PhD dissertation proposes a framework for a sociology of machines that reimagines human-machine relationships. Um, <clears throat> her research looks at playful and creative engagements with machines as a site to explore and experiment with human-machine socialities, and is, uh, she is interested in methodologies that reveal and trouble the commonsensical way in which we understand such relations. And then after uh, Cheda will be uh, Liasi Vanessa Lee Raymond, who's here with me in the space on my left. Uh, she is the Senior Program Manager for Abundant Intelligences. Um, hold on a second, there's things going on on my screen. Uh, she is a socio-technologist who is passionate about culture, political science, data ethics, and indigenous data sovereignty. She has a decade of experience building software for managing and visualizing Arctic environmental data. Uh, and she is the co-chair for the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Collaboration, or IARPS, data management team, and co-chair of the International Arctic Data Committee, and expert committee member for the U.S. Arctic Observing Network. She holds an MA in Arctic governance with a focus in Arctic security from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, and a BA in cultural studies from Hampshire, Hampshire College. And Raymond is proud of her Samoan heritage. And then next is going to be Dr. Suzanne Kite, who is in the lower right-hand corner. Oh, nope, now she's in the upper right-hand corner uh, of the big screen over there. Uh, she is in Oglala. Uh, Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer raised in Southern California with a BFA from Cal Arts in music composition and an MFA from Bard Bards College Milton Avery's Avery Graduate School and a PhD in fine arts from Concordia University. Her scholarship and practice investigate contemporary Lakota ontologies through research creation, computational media, and performance, often working in collaboration with family and community members. Kite has published in the Journal of Design and Science at MIT Press with the award-winning article, Making Kin with the Machines. Recently, Kite was a 2023 Creative Capital Award winner, 2023 USA Fellow, and a 2022-2023 Creative Time Open Call Artist with Alicia B. Wormsley. Kite is currently Distinguished Artist in Residence and Assistant Professor of American and Indigenous Studies at Bard College and a Research Associate and Residency Coordinator for the Abundant Intelligence's Indigenous AI Project. And then final, finally, last, last but not least, we have Michael Running Wolf, who is presently in the lower left hand. Oh, now he's in the upper right hand corner of the big screen over there. Uh, he is uh, Northern Cheyenne, Lakota, and Blackfeet, and was raised in a rural prairie village in Montana with intermittent water and electricity. So naturally, he has a master's of science in computer science. Uh, and he is a former engineer for Amazon's Alexa, a former faculty member at Northeastern University, and is pursuing a PhD in computer science at McGill University. Michael is researching indigenous language and cultural reclama culture reclamation using immersive technologies such as AR and VR, augmented reality and virtual reality, and artificial intelligence. His work has been awarded an MIT Solve Fellowship, the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, and a Patrick McGovern AI for Humanity Prize. Okay, so that's our fantastic, fabulous panelist. And uh, what I'm gonna do, so we're gonna have, each one of them is gonna present uh, a little bit about sort of their work and their kind of like entry uh, into this topic. And then we'll have a couple questions and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience uh, here in the, in the room with us and also online. Okay, okay, so Jada, take us away. 
Yes, great. Thank you, Jason. I'm assuming that you're able to see my screen. Yes. Amazing. So hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jada. I'm coming to you from Turkey today. It's midnight here and um, it's great. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about this project, the Abundant Intelligences, that I've been part of for about three years now. Um, but let me first briefly talk about my own work and how it relates to to the to Abundant Intelligences at large. And let me, this is us, and here's me. Um, so yeah, I just got my PhD in sociology uh, from Concordia, and uh, my dissertation work was mainly on social theory based on research creation projects. The projects that I undertook during my PhD had always kind of considered machines as social others and pursued the question of how to socialize differently with machines. The underlying aim was always to find ways to cultivate different sensibilities than what is given in the contemporary meaning matrices, especially around AI. You know, we always consider these entities as part and parcel of domination relations. There's too much fear and uncertainty and not enough joyous experimentation, especially not from ground up. So I tried to carve up a space mainly in sociological theory to make space for such creative collaborations. So as to start from a lively conception of a technologizing world uh, rather than the cold and rigid visions that have been passed down onto us from Project Modernity. Um, when I then first read Make, Making Kim with the Machines, which is the article that Jason and Suzanne had co-authored and, um, and has been a precursor to Abundant Intelligence's project, I saw an organic fit between our two approaches to studying and researching technology. Abundant Intelligence's too aims to make a new space by way of creative methodologies, and it too seeks to reignite joy by reconceiving the epistemological assumptions that underlie AI research. Because when we devote kind of a deeper look into the AI space to see what lies underneath all the smoke and mirrors, we see an epistemic regime that itself has facilitated the establishment of a colonialist capitalist patriarchal regime of violent practices. No wonder why we see the perpetuation of oppression and violence at the hands of these AI tools. Eh? They directly inherit certain Western rationalist epistemologies that work to exclude many different ways of knowing about the world. And I hope it's clear how problematic it is that such an enterprise should hold a strong stronghold over what intelligence means to our meaning worlds in our dominant paradigms of knowledge. And contrary to this, indigenous knowledge systems develop through living in a long-standing relationship with place, and they are characterized by close observation and experimentation, protocols guiding how to engage with such knowledge, and expectations of reciprocal and mutual care among amongst an entire web of beings that are present in that place. Indigenous knowledge reflects an understanding of intelligence different from mainstream AI research, offering alternative methods for considering how knowledge is generated, validated, and propagated. And this is where abundant intelligences as an indigenous-led and indigenous majority international and interdisciplinary team of experts enters the scene. So what is this research group about? Abundant intelligences, this project is funded by uh, SHRC and New Frontiers and Fr uh, Research Fund as a six-year program. Uh, as a research effort, effort, it imagines a new completely how to conceptualize, design, develop, and deploy AI based on indigenous knowledge systems. Our motivation comes from the fact that mainstream AI research relies on definitions of intelligence that evidently suffer from fundamental shortcomings that consistently operationalize bias against non-white, non-male, non-Western peoples. So we aim to bring in indigenous knowledge systems as a way to rebuild AI's epistemological foundations, transforming these tools from their current role in reinforcing colonial practices of exclusion extraction, manipulation, and eradication into engines for increasing our care for one another and our world. Oops, oh, sorry. So we use abundant intelligences because abundant implies both diversity and knowledge practices that contribute to thriving networks of being in a particular place. These practices focus on regeneration or leaving more for future generations, generosity or enabling and encouraging sharing with the other beings in our context. 
and reciprocity or emphasizing that we are in a relationship with those beings that requires we sustain each other. Abundance signals a plethora of futures, right? And it's also an expansion of the narrow definitions of intelligence that are currently favored by dominant AI research paradigms to embrace the multiplicity of human and non-human intelligences. We also choose abundant to invoke imaginaries that sustain and feed everyone, reinforcing how the entire project is grounded in particular territories whose lands nourish us. It turns us away from capitalist mindsets that treat overaccumulation and scar scarcity as productive of economic value and which propel practices of extraction and exploitation central to the project of indigenous erasure, while turning us towards a future where indigenous communities have the capacity to fashion AI that nurtures us. Abundant communities possess a cultural confidence that fosters innovation, imagination, and a joyous pursuit of many opp new opportunities to make a better world. So to achieve this, our program mobilizes an international and interdisciplinary team of experts coalesced in locally rooted pods, which you can think of as in research labs, uh, to collaborate with indigenous communities and learn from and with their knowledge holders to bring together, uh, to bring novel perspectives to transform AI. Our research is truly interdisciplinary as it incorporates pre uh, perspectives rooted in indigenous epistemologies and cultural knowledge practices, as well as uh, physical sciences, engineering and computer sciences, uh, humanities and social sciences, and art and design disciplines. You know, our co-investigators include names like Manulene Meyer, uh, Leroy Little Bear, and Linda Smith, as well as those from the AI space, like the Turing Award winner Joshua Bengio and Aaron Corville. Um, bringing together such diverse and amazing minds into common ground has been a vision that propelled the, the, the project itself. Um, and the research program is organized through local pods, like I said, the research labs that bring uh, the teams together, the research team together with knowledge holders, cultural practitioners, language keepers, educational institutions, and community vitalization organizations. These pods necessarily employ mixed methods. Uh, they weave together research creation, qualitative research, and quantitative uh, knowledge pro production approaches within a context of indigenous research framework. The pods provide the milieu that's necessary for an interdisciplinary integration, you know, using workshops and brainstorming sessions that are necessary to the success of this kind of investigation, imagination, and reconceptualization of AI. They are key sites for meeting and collaborating with local indigenous communities, training and increasing these communities' capacities in computational design, and building and testing prototypes for novel AI systems. So currently we have three active pods, one in Hawaii that focuses on soil practices and environment, uh, one in Canada, which is in collaboration between Lethbridge and Western universities that focus on art and AI intersection. And then one in Otero, New Zealand that focuses on language preservation and regeneration practices. Um, and we aim to support three more pods. So it's gonna be six in total minimum during the life cycle of our current grants. Um, and our program is composed of three main axes, the research axis, um, there is the integration axis, which explores how indigenous knowledge practices and frameworks can be synthesized with the mainstream knowledge frameworks used in AI research. Um, the imaginaries axis develops future imaginaries and speculative designs of indigenous AI to guide the design of novel AI systems that are better suited to indigenous flourishing. And then there's the intelligence axis, which brings indigenous perspectives to bear on the techno technical challenges that currently face mainstream AI research. Um, there is also a significant training component, as more than half of our grant uh, funding is devoted toward building capacity in indigenous community to train students in AI and in indigenous knowledges. Uh, and the research is concentrated into five areas. Uh, there is language, storytelling, environment, multi-agent systems, and social neuroscience. And we can talk about these more in the Q&A if you want to get more in depth, but I'm going to conclude and wrap it up just to save on time a little. Uh, but I want to reiterate as I conclude the way AI is created, the kinds of intelligences it promotes and rewards, and the social structures it endangers necessarily have fundamental societal impacts, obviously, right? 
Our program places indigenous peoples at the center of this contemporary creation story, collaborating with leading AI scientists. Again, the moment for this work is now because the technology is taking its fundamental shape. It is urgent as historically indigenous peoples have been excluded from designing the technologies that fundamentally affect us. And it is necessary as indigenous peoples have unique knowledge to contribute to creating better AI. And we believe this work will be rewarded both with AI that's transformatively more suited to indigenous people, but also other so-called marginalized populations and with an AI research field that is transformatively better equipped to build technologies that will help all people. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks a lot. See you in the Q&A. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jada. That was a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa. Yeah, thank you, Jada, for that overview. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Leasi Vanessa Lee Raymond. I am the Senior Program Manager of Abundant Intelligences. Um, hello to everyone online and hello to all of our team who are here hanging out with us today. Um, so I am joining the program very, very recently, so in the last three months, and it's great to hear Jada's perspective along with Jason. She's been here since the beginning. Um, I'm going to talk to you more about my background in data and how that will inform some of the program work we do. But again, in the Q&A, I can answer questions about the program or data or anything else. So today, I wanted to share some of my data dreams and data futures that I dream about. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jada. Thank you. So often I talk and write about data and emotions. Uh, for me, data is emotional or are emotional, if you want to be grammatical about it. And people are like, who's this Afakasi Samoan woman talking about data? Like, why is she doing that? And for me, um, it comes from a deep and yearning desire for data models, research, software that can hold the immensity the beauty, the power, the complexity of my culture and my heritage. And I should really say my cultures and my heritages. Um, next slide, Jada. It, um, it's more than that though, for me, it's also about how um, our language can be presented. <laughs> it's about how what we know to be true can be presented. And um, it's a desire to see myself it's a desire to see people like me. Uh, and more importantly, yeah, what we know to be true, right? What we know to be true that is not currently being represented. And I want that to be brought to bear on the big questions of today. Next question, next one, thank you. Um, I think I was really inspired by the talk just before this because similarly, my desires for data are about like deep knowledge and ancient knowledge and interconnected, like messy, intertwined knowledge. And uh, current data systems don't know how to handle that very well, or most of them. Next slide, Jada. So I, you know, I often have to give data talks that are much more mechanical. And so I was really excited to talk about the things I, I'm actually dreaming of um, right now and the things I think are actually exciting. So uh, in this slide, particularly, I'm speaking as myself, not as the Abundant Intelligences program, <laughs> just to add that caveat before we jump in. Um, so I am dreaming of Indigenous-led data design and Indigenous-led data institutions. So what does that mean? Um, for me, it means anything from Indigenous metadata standards and ontological frameworks. It could mean new Indigenous data licensing frameworks. It could mean indigenous-led data trusts that provide us with abundance. It could be um, data centers that are managed by tribes. And while we all can think of examples of this, we don't see uh, an overflowing of this. And so the future that I dream of is, is abundant. Um, I have renegade dreams of cyber defense and countermeasures, and so... <laughs> This is uh, people to protect and reinforce indigenous data sovereignty. And I daydream at my desk when I'm not responding to your email about white hat hackers going over here and doing a little bit, doing a little bit over here, doing a little bit over there. Um, I think there is a potency there for us to adopt some of those tools. 
I, I dream about co-opting the norm core data spaces and really um, rolling up with a crew, taking up space, uh, making noise. These are, this is an achievable dream, right? I could do that today and I don't. And so some of this dreaming is coaching for myself um, and imagining myself in a different way and allowing myself permission to grow. Um, I think quite a bit about going back to go forward. I think that uh, there is, our ancestors left us things that we have. And I think there's relevancy now for us to gain access to those. Um, and so this could be data rescue. This could be data archaeology. This could be access, like access to touching, holding archival objects. Um, this is repatriation and rematriation. And we heard a really powerful story of how art has been sort of interacting with that just before this talk. Um, and I think that, like Jada said, there's an urgency, I think, I feel strongly that we need to access those things now. Um, and then the last one is, is definitely a me thing. I feel like I coined this phrase. I maybe didn't, but data preppers. <laughs> um, I feel like the prepper mentality could be very useful for us. I think self-reliance. Um, so that could be the solar powered Raspberry Pi that runs your sensor network. It could be, you know, an edge computing device on your canoe any number of things, right? An air-gapped language model that you're training yourself. I think there's a lot of potential there. Okay, next one. Um, so I am a, a gift gifter. It's partially a cultural thing. It's partially just who I am. So uh, in my time here with you, I wanted to share a rubric or a framework that I apply myself when I feel lost, when I'm not sure if I'm going in the right direction or not. This is related to data systems, which you may or may not be designing on the regular, but you could inter uh, change that with the dinner party you're throwing or the art that you're curating or whatever else. Um, but I think in our daily life, we make a lot of compromises and we're often operating in a gray area and sometimes it's confusing. So questions to ask yourself when the way is not clear. And this is just four slides, I'll read them, Jada. And then there's a summary slide. So the first question that I ask myself is, could this data system reflect all that we know to be true? And by we, I mean we on this panel, I mean we in this room, I mean we, and I mean we. I mean a very capital we. <laughs> and this question is not, can this data system reflect all that we know to be true? Because to my knowledge, that doesn't exist. Um, Google has certainly tried, but it doesn't include our knowledge, right? Um, but if you even are close to saying maybe the system could reflect, maybe it has the potential to reflect all that we know to be true, you're doing amazing. You're doing amazing. Okay, next question. Um, does this data system strengthen or weaken our ability to govern ourselves? And the answer to that one should be pretty clear in your heart. So you know if you need more work to do. And, and I think we're, we're all operating in this gray area. So uh, don't be too hard on yourself if the answer is it weakens it. Uh, next question. Does this data system reinforce or diminish a sense of belonging with our language? And I have yet to interact with the data system that increases my sense of belonging with my language. So in that metric, there's a lot to be done in our world. And then the last question to ask yourself, does any aspect of this data system protect or endanger our homeland? So these are four questions that can help you really just check yourself and then you can decide what you wanna do next. And they're summarized there. That's my mail over to you. That is all I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, again, thank you for being here. It's your Friday too. It's raining out, so thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for sharing that. That's the first time I've heard a lot of that. And so it's really wonderful in that kind of comprehensive way. So it's really wonderful to see it all all together. OK, so next we are going to go to Suzanne, who is uh, uh, online. We're going to go back to the virtual world. There she is.
Hello. All right, I will share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna put on my, I wear many hats, um, but today I'm gonna put on just the art hat um, and talk about uh, AI as a possible non-human art collaborator. I'll start by saying on Peitu Washte, as you say, Machu Picchu, Oglala Hamacha, Shanta Washte, Nape Chizapo. Shake your hands with a happy heart. So um, when I make my art and I uh, put on my somewhat academic, but mostly art making hat, I'm thinking very specifically of this picture behind me, um, which is Kyle Dam. Um, and the area and the people who live um, in and around my uh, great -grand grandmother Evelyn Stover's home. And uh, very specifically, when I think through making work, uh, not regardless of its AI or if it includes AI, but um, no matter what, I'm thinking about all of these this is only a tiny snippet of my family tree, but some of these people in my family who um, worked very hard to communicate things um, and communicate their philosophies uh, and pass those down through our through our family. So I'm also going to talk about dreams um, for for this little bit uh, and talk about this practice that I'm trying to um foster within myself of translating and learning to speak in and learning to dream in the specific Lakota geometric language. So for example, this was a piece I had up um, in uh, New York City last year at the Center for Art Research and Alliances. It's a, an embro a digital embroidery machine with a uh, technically you could keep s attaching pieces forever but a sort of infinite piece of cloth with dreams um, that I had had every night they would get um, written down and then um, uploaded to this embroidery machine um, until eventually there were so many of these dreams about three months worth of, worth of dreams um, and then musicians would come in and um, use those as scores to um, realize those scores it's this is the term in the space and i'm thinking about um and during my phd research I, I was trying to think through this term that i heard jolene ricard use um a long time ago um which was cosmology scape um she mentioned it briefly in a talk in i think 2016 in banff the banff center uh, and this kind of radically reoriented me to how I think of art making and I think of non-human beings um, within that cosmology scape. So imagining that the world is not separated, non-humans are not separate from us, of course, but a very intricate, interconnected um, uh, place between where they were humans and and their and our art our, our art creation our knowledge movement of knowledge is connected to both the earth world and the spirit world so how did i get into ai i'll just give a little background um i started um as a composer and making um wearable electronics um this is the first piece that i had um one of those systems in called people you must look at me and um, started out as just simple open source um, softwares and handmade hardware um, assembled by a friend of mine at the time, James Hurwitz, who um, was really helpful in, in getting me started on this. And, and these were, I used them to control sound and video live on stage. Um, and over the years, many, many pieces later, it kind of transformed into this hair braid interface um, into uh, thinking through some of um, Abtech's uh, indigenous futurist 
workshops and imagining uh, new technologies um, from this sp specific perspective. Um, and then in 2018, I started to include a super fun and simple machine learning tool called Wekinator um, into the process. But more recently, um, I became really interested in what what are all of these very minute interactions with non-humans? Um, what are the what are the ethical implications of those? Um, what is the ethical practice of those? And how can those um, through art making, um, through Lakota methodologies, be really honed in on and um, and described? So. Um, I have a million things to say about that, but I'll just kind of present this specific um, theory. Uh, and I made these graphics in collaboration with Bobby Joe Smith, who's a Lakota designer. And in these, I'm, I'm just trying to articulate the, the feeling, the practice, the philosophy of making a new artwork, making anything. So in the center is this, we have the star and it um, it's the result of the collaboration between non-human um, physical world and the non-human non-physical world. And it's very interconnected with um, both the cosmos and the earth, of course. And um, in this process of making something new, bringing something into um, existence, whether it's a conversation or a, um, a workshop or an artwork or a song. There are so many protocols by which we can and we have learned and we discover how to uh, make this new thing in a good way and, and in an ethical way. And this, this graphic in particular reminds me of all of the tiny interactions we have to go through in order to, let's say, make a song and a new song in a good way. Um, perhaps you need to offer tobacco. Perhaps you need to um, be more reciprocal to be reciprocal to non-human beings in the process. So I see all of these things, while offering tobacco may seem irrelevant to building a new data set, I think that one of the what things that indigenous methodologies teach us is that all of those things um, these tiny interactions with the world, these really clear protocols that um, our elders teach us are super interconnected to the final outcome of everything. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead um, and talk specifically about this piece, um, which is uh, an example of what I'm trying to do now and going forward, which is taking specifically taking dreams. And in Lakota, the, the word for dream is not that, you know, you really you have to put some context around it because um, it could mean a waking dream or a sleeping dream or, um, but I've been very interested in sleep dreams and kind of the neuroscience behind sleep and transforming dreams into um, artworks um, and even with sound. So here's a little bit of this sound. <laughs> So, you know, I'm a composer, so I, you know, there's always music involved somehow, but all of this um, is kind of me trying to artistically and experimentally work through this idea that our Lakota geometries, um, often practiced by Lakota women and people who do women's work, are, um, are really interesting uh, language with which we can um, explore the creation of new things in the world. So I learned a great, I learned and learned a great deal about the movement of knowledge from the spirit world, from dreams um, into art artworks um, from uh, my aunt, Becky Redbow. Um, and this system I think is, is 
perpetually very interesting to me because it how it 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 currently can't really be addressed by the um machine kind of the large language mod it's not part it can't be part of a large language model they're 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 symbols and can't be rendered easily by you know systems like mid journey um uh they're um it's a complex system it tells narrative it can be reinterpreted infinitely over time and they're um uh yeah it's super interesting to me so i'm just going to skip to the end here and talk about uh kind of what i'm working on right now still trying to integrate these um these lakota design language into uh, performance art into composition to explore what it's like to look at these designs and um, make song from them, um, trying to expand that into a practice uh, uh, that is interdisciplinary and um, cross-cultural, especially working with musicians who are not uh, um, native. Um, I have a project coming up in the summer with Alicia Wormsley, um, where we'll be um, kind of working with Lakota designs on language and African American and West African design language to try to express our dreams and to help other people express their dreams uh, coming out of this Black and Indigenous dreaming project. So I'll end there. Um, uh, this is a quote I always like to include in my talks, um, uh, which was I asked my grandfather if uh, it was it was dangerous to look towards the future, um, to see the future, and he said spirits and ancestors are just there on the other side trying to help uh, so thank you great thank you so then uh and then for our final panelist michael running wolf there he is yeah do I have share screen privileges or is that not? I can, oh, there we go, sorry. <laughs> just, I have never done this before, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> yes, obviously I have. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm Michael Renewolf. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, First Things is AI Reality, um, and which is a project that's housed at a 501c3 in the United States and at Mila, um, which has been mentioned uh, prior. Let's go. Okay, so just to real quickly, this is a map um, talk uh, that shows the language families of uh, North America. Um, and the big gold one is Algonquin languages, and those languages include Cheyenne, Blackfeet, and languages like Seneca, Mohawk, and uh, Wapanoag on the East Coast. And it's the largest, most diverse language family in the United States with hundreds of different languages. And then you have the blue there, that's the Siouan language. And these are languages that are uh, language family is defined by linguistic science. And so um, there is a little bit of controversy around uh, complete accuracy. Um, and the research I'm conducting is primarily on the, um, on the West Coast. And you notice something as you're looking at this map is that it's basically a map of um, colonization, manifest destiny. The white areas are where no languages exist anymore or not being spoken anymore. And so, and as you get closer and closer to the West Coast, you know, 80% of languages in Canada are in British Columbia. Um, and it's also true for the United States. The West Coast has the majority, the highest language that, uh, density, so you can language family density. So each one of these colors represents a language family with dozens of languages, at least hundreds in some cases. Um, and so why is this important? As we're, why is it important that we're, protecting and re reclaiming and rebuilding the language diversity within the United States, it's because it represents our ways of knowing. And as the other speakers have basically talked, I'm making my talk much, much easier because now the audience is couched in what I'm trying to talk about is that it fundamentally defines our ways of knowing, our how we say something reflects the underlying function of how our relationship is to that object. And for instance, when we think of our landowner and we're paying rent, we in particularly, you know, in Quebec in particular, there's this relationship you have with your landowner, which is not entirely positive. But what if you 
but the landowner, this concept of landowner was applied to a tree. And this is how Nuchano conceptualizes what is a landholder? It's a, it's a, literally a tree. That's who it, who owns the land. It's the tree. And so the research we're working on is focused on creating practical, pragmatic, technical um, systems that allow for, that exist holistically within the community. What does that mean? I mean, um, cheap, easy, and uh, efficient, and has contextual relationship with the community deck so that it can be effective. You know, what we're trying to do is swing back this pendulum. 70% of languages in Canada are endangered. Most of them are critically endangered. And so as we're looking at language technology, um, to date, unfortunately, has been built upon a model of replicating what works for French or teaching English or teaching Mandarin or German in class. And they don't work because these languages are just fundamentally different than languages in North America. Um, for instance, we just have a just a functionally, it's essentially just a different type of math on how languages in North America are constructed and built and the way the phrases are constructed, the words are constructed versus the Western languages. Um, and I'm not going to dive too much into in here because we can't spend all day talking about this, but um, in linguistics, you have this concept of a morpheme. And for English, uh, a morpheme is just, to step it back a little bit, morpheme is a the smallest amount of sound that conveys meaning. And so the red car is three morphemes, you know, conjugation of to be, color, and automobile. And if you add an S to the car, now you have four morphemes. The red cars, the S conveys plurality. So now in your mind, you're constructing this idea that there's two red cars, maybe two VW Beetles that are painted red. Um, and that's polysynthesis right there, that little bit of addition to S. And polysynthesis exists for every language in the world, but it's a gradient scale. And English is particularly non-polysynthetic. Languages in North America are on the extreme edge. It's very likely that Languages in the United States, in particular, the United States and Canada, you know, are particularly polysynthetic relative to the rest of the world. And so we are researching that these languages in the Northwest, that's why the focal point is on the Northwest. Because uh, if we can solve these technical problems, we won't be able to apply these technical strategies to other languages across the United States. And so, for example, here, this is an example of a word. The practical effect is that indigenous languages in North America um, don't have a finite amount, don't have a finite dictionary. So the American, for English, for example, uh, American English versus Canadian English, you know, the, you basically say there's 60,000 words. And so when you talk to an AI, you, your dictionary is about 60,000. It seems like a lot, but on the scale of the universe and infinity, that's like nothing. Uh, and that's what we need to solve for indigenous languages and being able to convey, map the infinity to something that uh, by its nature necessitates being uh, a binary and finite. Um, and so the strategy uh, is, you know, multi-threaded strategy here is because we need to solve a variety of different problems. Um, we, in addition to having a very fundamentally different way of constructing our languages, uh, they're phonetically very different. You know, the sounds being conveyed in indigenous languages in North America are very different in Europe. Um, side note, I kind of wonder if the American and Canadian English accent is just because of early contact with the Northeastern tribes <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> that might be the, the difference, actually, by the way, and why... Quebec French is very different from French French, in, but I won't go dive too deep in that because there's controversy in that particular province. <laughs> I'm safely over here in uh, Vancouver, by the way, sunny Vancouver, I'm wearing my, um, my Beats shirt. Uh, and we don't have enough data. You know, in business communities, we, there's not a lot of speakers because our languages are going extinct. Uh, so we may only have a dozen speakers. Or, or if we're fortunate, uh, like my mother's tribe, we may have a five, few hundred. The Lakota, they have several thousand. And the Mohawk and larger languages, they have you know thousands and thousands of people who speak these languages. But that's nothing. Um, when you think of AI, 
the idea of low resource, which is just the technical term for a language that doesn't have a lot of documentation in literature, uh, German and Turkish is at the border of a high of a low resource language. They're kind of straddling the border of languages that don't have enough resources to build AI for. And so that's and you think of those like 80 million Germans and plus probably another double that of German as a second language. That's a lot. You're talking about hundreds of millions uh, of people. And we have AI for you can comfortably make AI for them because they're you know relatively high resource, low resource languages. So we're dealing with data sets that, you know, maybe two, three hours, 20 hours at the outset. Um, and so what we're doing is approaching this from a stone soup perspective where we're collectively bonded, banding together over different tribes together with a collective vision and pooling our data. And that, that can, I won't dive too much into this exact specific details, but that's generally the idea and that we don't have to get over this data problem. We we have to work together. Languages, community, language communities must work together. And this is actually out of date. Um, we were just four communities here. We're working with four, and then we have probably another dozen in the wings that we're pausing because we just don't have that the technical capacity capacity right now to onboard more languages. Um, so here's the team. I'm not a polymath. I am just the the front man, <laughs> kind of, so to speak. Uh, this is an international effort. There's the four tribes here. We start with James Ross in uh, Northwest Territories, Sarah Child, who's Quagudo, Maria, who's Macaw, and, and Another language we're working in English community is Andreas um, Miwak, our, our data scientist, our true uh, polymath is probably Dr. Sansosi and Dr. Connor Quinn, and me and Caroline are uh, working on this, and she's focused on XR. Um, so we work with Mila. These we had interns over the summer. This is Faith Baca, Kyron, uh, Dane, and Ryan, and our tamed linguist in the corner there. Um, and there's sort of just real quickly, just keeping forward to those in the audience. Uh, this is a QR card. This will take you to the Mila website, kind of describe it more. There's more resources there as well on how to contact us. And that's that. Okay, great. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay, so we got about 12, uh, 12 minutes. So I'm going to, I think what I'll do is I'll ask one question. And then, uh, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to see if there's uh, if there's any questions. I have more questions, of course, but I'm hoping that you guys have questions and also online as well. Um, so, what I'm interested from from each of you at the moment is thinking about this question of sort of do you have concerns or about bringing knowledge's knowledge from your communities into the realm of AI research and creative practice practice. Um, and then if so, how do you address, uh, address those concerns? So I'll, um, I'll actually start with uh, Suzanne and, uh, and then go to Michael and then come back to Vanessa on that one. And then Cheda, if you have some observations from your perspective on that. Yeah, of course, I have lots of um, hesitations and worries, and I feel like a protocol um, that has for millennia kept us safe and kept our knowledges safe and functional um, is it's a challenge to apply that to data sets and artificial intelligence and even social media. And um, I think that that is absolutely the i think was and is the reason that this idea of an indigenous protocol for artificial intelligence is a great approach um because we know that these protocols are there for a reason um and uh so i think my particular concern like other tribal members is about intellectual property rights um it's about uh, the the ease and the lack of responsibility um, where other people's other people feel like they can have access to our property and our knowledge um, without reciprocity or with or don't feel the need to protect our people and our knowledge the way we do. 
and uh, I think that's a lack of protocol in, in other communities and a lack of um, cohesive social responsibility. But uh, I think the way that I imagine abundant intelligences contributing to this is to set precedents, to set some sort of baseline applications for how one does build data sets and maintain their safety um, in our communities and to show other researchers, um, native and non-native, that with the right, the, with the bare minimum, which is funding, um, we can apply safety mechanisms and methodologies um, and create good and interesting and useful tools. Great, thank you. Michael? Yeah, I think um, Suzanne covered a lot of the ground, and, which I won't repeat. I think the, the short story, what I would say um, from my perspective is that a lot of tribes shouldn't work with AI. I think it's gonna be a community by community decision and it's perfectly okay. You know, it's just, it's not magic. There's nothing modern AI, in particular large language models, do that are actually different. There's actually, in and out, to say it quite frankly, generative AI is a toy. It's not making money. You're seeing a lot of layoffs in the tech space right now because they're, they're warming up data centers running these large expensive um, NVIDIA hardware when normal, conventional, traditional, ye old computer science algorithms work fine. You know, there's a body of really interesting research being done by the NRC that eschews modern AI because it works. You know, and these, these technologists and language communities are working using normal, non-AI, non-modern technology strategies because it works. Um, and, and then the other thing, the last thing I'll mention is this data sovereignty is significant. We have all these frameworks in which to approach how data sovereignty is to be seen. But what we've not, we are not seeing yet are practical implementations like open source licenses that say licenses that are open sourced that basically say tribes own the data. And if you're going to work with a large entity like Concordia or Miguel or UDM, that the community retains total ownership of the, the data and they are a research partner of the data and there are obligations to the communities encoded within the contracts. And yes, of course, there's discussion around should we even participate in the legal framework? If you're using AI, you already passed the, the border and barrier of working within the Western legal framework. Um, and so but what's missing right now, I think the actual practical implementations, and that's something I'm really excited. We're working on at Flare is that we're working with lawyers and a legal team to actually encode that. We're going to sign contracts alongside Mila that enshrines that the data is the communities. We are using this data to develop a strategy that scales and reclaims languages. And it's not necessary to claim ownership of the data. And I, it's really important that we have entities like Mila um, who are willing to respect sovereignty of data in a practical, on the ground, functional way. Great. Okay, thank you. We'll be talking to you about those Mila licensing con conversations sometime soon. <laughs> okay, Vanessa. Yeah, I was definitely taking notes of that as well. <laughs> um, I, I think like what everyone else has said, I have a lot of hesitation about it. I don't necessarily think it's mine to give. Um, certainly not me, but um, I don't know who would have the authority to give certain types of knowledge. Our, a lot of our knowledge is, is through family lines. So that would be a a logistical headache, really, just to even get all the permissions. <laughs> Our language, we have multiple uh, levels of language. Not everyone knows and is even allowed to know certain types of language. So there's there's really a lot of protocols that 
I can't imagine how that process would go. And like I think both of um, Suzanne and Michael said, we don't have the institutions ready to handle that. We don't have the licenses. We don't have the provenance. We don't have the technologists who understand what we need to do in order to code it. And so what's exciting about abundant intelligences is that we get to sort of prove it in spaces where we can and really show to our communities how this could be beneficial. Um, and then we get to dream again. And so it's really, to me, a great way to explore this in a safe space um, and then to allow a flourishing that comes after that. Okay, great. Thank you. Jada? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, everyone, uh, um, I totally agree. Like the... Um, uh, uh, there should be a care and there should be like an acknowledgement of like potential problems when bringing in kind of ancient knowledges or different histories into these like novel technology spaces. But also I feel like that's kind of a necessary work. I don't know if we're kind of aiming for a tech, you know, social change too, because when we leave technology development in its normal course uh, of development, we're retaining the status quo and they're, you know, getting hooked up into these certain histories that carry the weight of, again, like the colonialism and capitalism or uh, or their brother patriarchy. Um, so, yeah, I find it kind of necessary, actually, like, or or actually exciting. Like, maybe, maybe we can actually uh, uh, create that, uh, create, or break that bond between the technology and this kind of like the, the flow of history that they inherit from the Western frameworks. But yeah, obviously abundant intelligence's work is, uh, uh, yeah, is the, the role is going to be very significant. I think in yeah finding and, and, and charting the way of like, how do we actually uh, um, retain the dignity and, and, and also, you know, yeah, create data sovereignties and uh, and yeah, establish the protocols like yeah, Suzanne, Michael, and and Vanessa has been saying. Um, but yeah, okay, great, thank you, thank you, thank you all for those those replies. And now I want to throw it out to the audience, either here or online, uh, to see if there are any questions. And somebody will be coming around with a mic if there is. Raise your hand so they can see you. If anybody online has any questions, you can just pop them in the chat or you could turn on your camera and ask. Vanessa. Um, so throughout a lot of the presentations I noticed um, and in kind of how you go about it, um, imagining and dream uh, is kind of brought up as a uh, methodology. So I was just wondering if you could speak more to um, how you incorporate those two topics, like imagining and dreaming, um, both in like actual, like actual physical dreams, but also the metaphorical dreams um, and how, what kind of, what were the challenges of bringing that into abundant intelligences, both as like the unit itself and engaging with institutions? Well, I mean, actually, I f I'm curious what Jada has to say about it because I um because I wasn't involved in I wasn't so involved in getting the imag the the imaginary um part into the into like integrated into the language, but it's awesome that it's there, um because you know we know I'm I I'm I have a really I'm I'm pretty partial to the word dream now because I love that it is so um it's such a or there's a lot of things about English that I don't like as a language, but the word dream and the way it's like used is one of the, one of those words that is just, it's, it's, it just doesn't quite capture the immensity um, of what's possible in this idea of dream. And I love that it's multiple uses in Lakota. Um, I bet. And if you looked at other linguistic um, uses of it across the world, it would also reveal many things. But you know, but the fact is, indigenous methodologies require the creation. Um, we don't, you know, the when we work with our communities, storytelling is number one. Communication and sharing is number one. Making things and gifting them and giving them away is is also number one. These things are how we move knowledge 
and make new knowledge in the world. And so I, I think that's why I'm so glad that we have this future imaginary um, and imaginaries methodol methodological um, focus in budget intelligences. But the 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 thing about it is what 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 keeps me interested in in AI. Um, because sometimes I'm I'm like I, I'm so over it. I'm so over how how small the thinking can be out there in the world. But what keeps me really engaged is this question of what is art? It, like it, it allows us to keep asking that question and what is consciousness and, and how does creation form in the world? And I think that's where dreams are still such a mystery um, in neuroscience, which is so great that we can still have unknowability in, in the world. It's where did that thought come from? Did it come from me? Did it come from elsewhere? Who? where why um so yeah that's why i love dreams um yeah that's great and uh i mean for the imagination part i guess i would i mean sociology also just starts from imagination not weirdly i guess i mean sociological imagination is kind of like our core methodology coming into any kind of work that we want to do um and imagination is 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 about kind of connecting the troubles and that we carry, like the concerns that we carry into like kind of large structural issues also in a way I find. Um, so it's 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 kind of like a tool to make those connections that might not be super salient in the, you know, unproblematic flow of everyday life, basically. Um, also, I mean, the yeah, I mean, bringing in imagination into AI space, there is already a current imaginary that's ongoing, right? The, the imaginary that we we are so now used to seeing in the Hollywoods and and whatever is like the sci-fi tropes and whatnot uh, that in the mainstream. Um, and so, can we yeah, reimagine this? So, like the future imaginaries workshops that we've done were both a way to make a conversation, but also a way for people to articulate what is really what is really about them that can connect to these technologies that we use in our everyday lives. So it's a way for them to connect their own concerns into, again, you know, like these large structures that supposedly dominate our lives. Like it's a way to gain agency, I find. And that's why imagination is so central to design as well, right? I mean, and AI design too. And like I said, yeah, there is an already ongoing imagination, but when we really tackle that zone and when we really uh, carve out a space that we can uh, uh, concretely tackle within our uh, with this faculty, I yeah, I think I think it's uh, it's super valuable once again, um, especially in AI spaces because yeah, like Suzanne you said, it's such a narrow thinking that's that's dominant it seems in these spaces. Great, thank you, Cheda. Michael, have anything to say on this? Uh no, and I actually do have to leave. If I can go off script for one second, there is another question around. I'll just repeat it real quickly. I'll summarize, do my best to summarize, but this is a question on, uh, there's Jesuit grammars created for uh, an individual's language and they were created using extractive methodology and going forward, how can we avoid this kind of strategy? Um, and is that possible in this kind of data sovereignty? I, I think the dynamic here is that we need to stop seeing language our indigenous languages as a school subject, like fundamentally, and this is where that kind of that Jesuit kind of comes in and say that when you want to speak your language, you should do it as part of who you are. And we should teach it as such, meaning that we should be teaching math and science, indigenous science, indigenous methodology. We should be writing essays in indigenous languages and get away from this model that it's another type of going to a forced French class if you're in Quebec or taking you know, Japanese or something. It's not an academic exercise for indigenous peoples. It's who we are. And I think that's also where the sense of exploitation comes from and that it's always been treated as an academic exercise by western societies which is also important like efforts like abundant intelligence to normalize the use of advanced technology um for indigenous uh, concepts and with that i have to jump off because i'm late to another meeting sorry jason <laughs> but okay thank you very much going. it's been an honor great thank yeah. you michael for taking the time and join us okay so vanessa do you want to 
speak to imagination to close this out? Um, I mean, a lot has been said. For me, the dream space is another plane where lots of types of interaction can happen uh, for me, at me, with me. <laughs> and so I, I, to me, it's another space in which we can welcome other ways of knowing in. That's all I have to add. Okay, great. Um, so on that, we'll formally close out this panel. Can we please uh, show our appreciation for the panelists for a really rich and, and great conversation. I love these conversations because it's, yeah, it reminds me why we're doing this work, uh, such interesting and varied ways of looking at this problem. But I think everybody sort of going towards similar goals of, uh, of indigenous sort of uh, uh, abundance and thinking through how can we really enrich our communities and use these technologies in ways that are good for our communities. Um, okay, so I guess I just sort of segue into the the bye bye now, Hans. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that is it for the FRC symposium, our second annual symposium. Uh, Want to say uh, thank you, everybody who's here in the room with us, everybody who joined us online over the last couple of days uh, for a really great series of conversations. Uh, one of the things we want to do uh, within the IFRC over the next couple months, anyways is uh, is edit these videos um, so that, well, actually that's not true. They're already available on the force space because we're doing with the force space this year. Uh, so you can go and look at what uh, the previous panels were if you would like to do that on the fourth space uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and then also we're gonna edit the, the videos from the first uh, symposium last year uh, so that we can put them up on the web and people can, people can appreciate them there. So, um, I just want to close with some uh, some appreciation. So thank you to all of our students and faculty and uh, support staff uh, who participated in this uh, in this event as panelists and as moderators. Um, the wonderful team at uh, Fourth Space. Uh, so Doug and Bertie and Jacqueline um, doing such a really fantastic job of keeping the tech running smoothly, making everything look good, making it look really easy. Um, the equally wonderful folks at Shift, who will be hosting our reception that we're gonna we can wander over to in a moment. Um, our colleagues at Milieu Institute for Art, Culture, and Technology, Bart Simon, Harry Smoke, and uh, Mark Bolu. Um, also, our Office of Research, uh, which uh, which is sort of our institutional home for the Indigenous Futures Research Center. Uh, and um, thank you to Tarsiso Cataldi, one of our research assistants who did the design work for us. Uh, for Bronson Jacques, who uh, is one of our former research assistants who is wandering around here with a great big camera. I don't see him right now, uh, who uh, is, did the, is doing the, uh, the image documentation for us, and to Chef uh, Swanej for catering our reception. Um, and then finally to the IFRC team. Uh, so Nico Wong Hul, uh, and Joel Dubé, and of course to uh, Hans Luhan Torres, who is our research center coordinator who masterminded all of this. It was fantastic. Hannah and I just had to show up and everything was like in place and five by five. So thank you very much, Hans and your team. Okay, so now we're done. And as we've said a couple of times, there's a reception at the shift space. So just go, go diagonal from that door right there to the other corner. Uh, of this building. And again, thank you all for coming and joining us today. Thank you all for coming online. Uh, get some sleep, sleep, Cheda, Suzanne, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. We got nothing to add. That was amazing. We're going to be closing up the live stream in the Zoom and uh, we'll see everyone soon. Secret shout out to Hans and Joel for that.